I tell you what, it's, it's not like the olden days. days. I'm Rosie. I'm Jake. And this is our fourth podcast on the olden days. Today we're talking about Alvin and the Chipmunks, or the Chipmunks, or the Alvin Show, depending on which particular incarnation of those characters we're talking about. Of course, the first Chipmunks that Jake and I saw was the 1980s cartoon series Alvin and the Chipmunks, which then changed its name to The Chipmunks a bit later. But uh, why don't I fill you in on the whole history of The Chipmunks before we talk about that? Does that sound good, Jake? Yes, let's do that. Well, you can read in a lot of detail on the Chipmunks' official website and uh, other sites which have sort of copied the story, such as Wikipedia, all about how the Chipmunks came into being, but I shall try to be succinct. Ross Bagdasarian Sr. created the Chipmunks when he was trying to break through into the music industry, and he had a tape recorder which children nowadays don't know what that is, do they? No, they don't. Even people of about 18 can't change a tape without being told by someone over 25. It's absolutely ridiculous. You can read about how he had the most cutting-edge thing that you could record on. So actually, I'm afraid I don't know what it was. But it was quite unusual, I gather, for people to be able to speed up the voices on their own recordings. So he had a certain amount of success using this fantastic new technology with Witch Doctor, which everybody knows, I hope. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, tang, wall, all, bing, bang. Then things sort of petered out, but he'd had a certain amount of success before with songs such as Come On In My House, and he'd got some parts in some media things. For instance, he's one of the people who live in the apartment block in Rear Window. He's a pianist. Famous Alfred Hitchcock film there. But anyway, after Witch Doctor sort of petered out, he decided that it would be fun to make the funny voice belong to some kind of animal. And you can read all about how he didn't know what it would be, and he had all kinds of ideas. And then he was inspired to create the character of Alvin when he met an audacious chipmunk who faced down his car. And what a legacy that chipmunk has left. So then he wrote and recorded the chipmunk song, in brackets, Christmas Don't Be Late, using his own voice as David Seville and Alvin, Simon and Theodore. And you can read all about how when it was released he used the name David Seville rather than Ross Bagdasarian because he was afraid that people might think he was a bit too Jewish. It was a huge success and everybody loved it and things went on from there really. The first television appearance that the Chipmunks made was on the Ed Sullivan Show. And I've actually seen this on YouTube, and by today's standards, it looks pretty rubbish, but we mustn't sneer, because there wasn't really anything else they could do. They had Ross standing there uh, in front of this sort of puppet theatre, and the Chipmunks were three puppets who looked like Chipmunks. And if you've seen the chipmunks in the 1980s or the 1990s, you'll know why that's a relevant point. Of course, the only thing they could do would be for Ross to lip-sync along to the song, including the I'll write you chipmunks part, and the three chipmunk puppets to sort of sway about. And it doesn't look fantastic by today's standards, but it's a very, very interesting piece of history, and really they couldn't have done anything else, could they, without the help of CGI? That's right. Obviously he couldn't sing the four parts live because three of them were sped up to different speeds for Alvin, Simon and Theodore. Then, off the back of this success, Ross was able to make The Alvin Show. So Simon and Theodore are very much supporting characters. And I've seen some of The Alvin Show on YouTube as well. It started in 1961, and it didn't run for a very long time. It might have been 1961 to 1962 or something like that. I didn't actually check that one. But what I find quite interesting is the social, cultural, and historical context. Alvin is trying to bring Dave around to the idea of rock and roll, and he wants to sing rock and roll music and play rock and roll music, and Dave is the old fuddy duddy who thinks that uh, rock and roll is immoral and music should be always traditional. The bit of the Alvin show I like relates to that because it's when it's got the stupid woman from the music society coming round saying 
that the society wants to bring back Bach alive! Which I thought was very funny, because it changes her from just caricature of fuddy-duddy old music society woman to actual mad necromancer. Yes, that's a very good bit. Uh, the Alvin show was very good. It was very segmented. It had a lot of musical segments, and it had short little sort of stories like that one Jake's just mentioned, and often they would sing in those. I think occasionally they didn't, but there was always plenty of music to enjoy. And what Ross Bagdasarian particularly wanted was for children to be able to join in and engage with the music. And if you find on YouTube a musical segment of the album show, it's very easy to pick up the beat. It's very simple songs. They did a lot of traditional nursery rhymes such as Daisy Daisy and Get Along Little Doggies, which we don't really have over here. <laughs> Ragtime Cowboy Joe, which is another one I didn't know and Clementine and Alouetta, and things like that, which I'm going to skip forward to the noughties now, which is in quite extreme contrast to Chipmunk songs from the movies, which we will talk about in more detail later, but uh, it's impossible to sing along to those. There's all these different harmonies and things layered on. So, in a way, that element of the Chipmunks and their music has been lost. I find it interesting how in the Alvin show they've got the basic character designs that you'll see in all later incarnations of the Chipmunk. Alvin with his red and the yellow A on the front of his shirt. Simon in blue with his glasses, Theodore in green. I remember seeing an old record sleeve where the three chipmunks all looked the same, and I think they're all wearing red. The Alvin Show is the parent of, I think, all subsequent chipmunks, television and movies. Absolutely. I think the record sleeve you're thinking of is the first chipmunk song, the Christmas song that they did. And I seem to remember they've got these sort of red romper suits on and they've got initials on S-A-T. And annoyingly, the one who's looking mischievous and playing with the hula hoop has got a T on. Well, that's wrong. That was meant to be Alvin. That's just typical, isn't it? But the characters were redesigned. They appeared on a few record sleeves like that, actually, with the singles that they released before the Alvin show, such as Alvin's orchestra and Alvin's the president. So you can see how it was all about Alvin. When they got their own cartoon show, apparently a lot of thought went into how the characters should look. And I I read that it was considered that on these record sleeves with their great big sharp teeth, they looked a little dangerous and rat-like and rabid. So that's why they look less like actual chipmunks in the Alvin show. But they do still look very rodentine, and perhaps later we'll discuss how they have come to look less rodentine over the 80s and 90s. And then more rodentine for the movies, and then a lot less rodentine again in the new animated series. But yes, the Alvin show was very good, very funny, very engaging. Uh, I think as it went on, Simon and Theodore got a bit more character. I'm thinking of the one where they're singing along to the player piano and Alvin's going to sing and he makes them pump pedals and Theodore goes, that sounds like fun! And Simon goes, that sounds like we do all the work! Ah, some characters emerging there, like you'll see in the latest cartoon series. That's right, whereas in the earlier stuff, particularly when they were just putting animation to things like Alvin's Orchestra and Alvin's The President, they would just stand there and sing and support Alvin. So what happened next? Nothing really happened for about 20 years. On the special features of Alvin and the Chipmunks, a squeak called DVD, which I have, I learned all about Ross Bagdasarian Jr. and his wife Janice Carmen approaching networks and TV people and saying, would you be interested to, in relaunching the Chipmunks and everyone telling them, no, go away. And he also talked about how he wanted to do it 
because it was shortly after the sudden and unexpected death of his father. And then what actually happened, and this is from the lips of Ross Bagdasarian Jr. himself, it's not just something I've read on Wikipedia or somewhere, what actually happened was that somebody doing a radio show speeded up one of the records for a joke and said, this is the new Chipmunk CD, and there was this huge response, everyone saying, where can I buy it? And then some network contacted Ross and Janice and said do you want to do this chipmunks thing then and they said yeah and do you remember Jake seeing that Christmas special where they look a bit weird and Alvin gives his harmonica to a sick child yes I do that's the pilot, isn't it, practically, for Alvin and the Chipmunks in the 80s? Yes, it's very different from what they ended up with. It's a sort of stepping stone between the Alvin show and Alvin and the Chipmunks, which is what came of it. They look really ugly. <laughs> they got funny cheeks with funny sort of spots on them. Hmm, I'm not sure if they're meant to be freckles or some sort of rodent thing. It's really weird. They do look a bit bizarre. And they're singing their Christmas song. Well, I think that's the first thing you see them doing because that's the most famous thing and the thing that everyone associated them with. So they were reassuring everyone, look, this is a relaunch of the chipmunks that you know and love. Dave didn't have much sort of character in his voice and all he would really do was stand there saying, come on, let's sing the song now. But of course, the reason that Alvin was late this time and... Dave had to shout Alvin at him was because he'd been off trying to help this sick child at Christmas time. It involved his harmonica very heavily, which was quite a staple of the Alvin show, and that kind of sort of disappears when you get into Alvin and the Chipmunks, which is the thing that I watched in the early days, but it was the closest thing I had for a while to a favourite TV programme. Nothing ever seemed to grab me in the same way that Nightmare grabbed Jake. But what I did like about the Chipmunks was that it was my choice. It was something that I would decide to watch rather than sit down to watch TV and Jake would want to watch it. And I probably liked it because it was quite simple to follow and it had the funny voices and it was easy to understand who the characters were and what they were like. That started Alvin and the Chipmunks in 1983, before I was born, but it was repeated over here on CBBC ad nauseum, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I didn't used to watch Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon that much. I used to see it and think, oh, they don't look as much like Chipmunks as Chip and Dale over on the Disney Club on the ITV. I don't think I like them very much. I didn't have that problem because I had absolutely no idea what a chipmunk was for a very long time because we actually don't have them living native here in England. And the first time I saw a chipmunk was in a pet shop. I thought, oh, well, they do look more like Chip and Dale than Alvin, Simon, Theodore, Brittany, Jeanette and Eleanor. But I didn't really care by then because I'd already fallen in love with the show. Speaking of Brittany, Jeanette and Eleanor, they are, of course, the Chipettes. They are introduced in a very early episode of Alvin and the Chipmunks, which I happen to have seen. They find them in this hotel where they see a sign up saying the Chipmunks are playing a gig and they're all like, oh, I didn't know we were playing this gig, we'd better go and do it. And then they find the Chipettes calling themselves the Chipmunks and they have a bit of a fight over who's going to get the name and the Chipmunks win. And then I think it's Alvin who comes up with the last second when they're sort of introducing themselves on stage with the name The Chipettes. And then The Chipettes are happy with that and everything's fine. Everything's male orientated, of course. The chipmunks are the men and the chipettes are the women. Yes, that's because it was 1983 when uh, things had come on a long way for women. And of course, that's why the chipettes were there in the first place. But uh, things weren't quite equal, and in many ways, they still aren't. What am I saying? In that episode, the chipmunks actually dressed up as the chipettes to try and sabotage their performance, which they were going to do to see if they could win the name, which is easy to do because the chipettes to look at are very much female versions of the chipmunks. And if you didn't really know very much about it, you might assume that their characters are exactly the same, but in fact, they're not. Alvin and Brittany are the most similar. They're both very sort of self-centred and narcissistic in many ways. They both want to be these huge, famous, 
rock slash pop stars. I think the chipmunks are more rock and the chipettes are more pop, the way they try to portray them. And they're both very strong, very forceful personalities, which is why they have this love-hate relationship. They kind of clash. They both want to be in charge. They both want to be the centre of attention. But then underneath it all, they're actually extremely fond of each other. The other thing they have in common is that they both have the oldest sibling aspect and feel very protective towards the two other members of the trio. That's right. They both fiercely love their siblings. What's different about them? Brittany is not so out of control as Alvin. She is much less inclined to go climbing up mountains and enter skiing competitions and whatever else Alvin does. She likes to stay out of trouble, and she's more narcissistic than Alvin, I should say. She is extremely self-obsessed, but then, of course, her redeeming quality is that she will do anything for her siblings, and also she comes through for the chipmunks sometimes as well. So that's Alvin and Brittany. The other two pairs, if you like, are very different. Simon is the very hyper-intelligent, very sensible one. And actually, he has a very interesting dynamic with Alvin, doesn't he? Yes. (laughs) Even though he's not someone who wants to rush headfirst into trouble or anything like that, he's very sensible and level-headed. He's also a very strong personality. And how do you put it, Jake, when Simon and Alvin are having a scene together? They vie for dominance of the scene and dominance of the relationship. That's right. What will usually happen is that Alvin will want to do something mad and Simon will want to talk him out of it and they will be pretty much on a par. I'm going to digress a little bit from talking about the Chipettes because now is the time to talk about Theodore, who both of them very much baby. He is not a strong personality at all. He lets Alvin and Simon both dominate him. So if it's a scene with Theodore and either one of the other two, then the uh, one of the other two, Alvin or Simon, will lead. If it's with all three of them, then Alvin and Simon will sort of mollycoddle Theodore together and they'll put aside their differences if they're having any at that particular time and patronise Theodore. Actually, there's some very good scenes in Alvin and the Chipmunks' The Squeakle, which really epitomise that relationship. So then Jeanette is Simon's counterpart, for want of a better word, and it has been speculated in this house that they have the weakest connection relationship kind of a thing. Someone's drawn a nice picture on uh, DeviantArt of Simon and Jeanette getting it on, and Jake says to me, you can't really imagine how they got there, can you? They don't really seem to have a lot in common or to be able to communicate very effectively. Simon is the hyper-intelligent one, the most intelligent of the six, I'm sure, and Jeanette is possibly, it would be harsh to say, the stupidest, but certainly the vaguest, weakest, least on the ball, dippiest, and I, I don't seem to think that she and Simon really interact and communicate properly, they don't really seem to click. The fact that they both wear blue and have glasses is the only similarity between them, and it's not really enough for a compelling relationship. I think, sadly, that is true. I think it's shown in some episodes that Jeanette has academic intelligence. She can sort of get on at school, but she lives on cloud cuckoo land, doesn't she? She's away with the fairies. She doesn't have much idea what's going on. She's clumsy, as a popular way that they show that visually. Sometimes, for instance, in the Chipmunk Adventure, which we must talk about soon, she will ask Simon for advice because she thinks she's got some idea, but she worries she's a bit too dippy to get everything right. And she admires Simon's intelligence and his sense, I think. And you could you could make a dynamic where he sort of helps to ground her and she helps him to lighten up and, and see things in a in a more magical kind of way, but uh, they don't really do that, do they? It's a shame that's never really been carried off, or any attempt has been made to carry it off in any of the chipmunks' incarnations. And then there's Eleanor, my personal favourite chiphead. By the way, Alvin is my favourite chipmunk. I think he's absolutely excellent. But Eleanor's my favourite chiphead because she is, unlike Theodore, very confident, 
Janice Carmon on this uh, interview on the DVD I was talking about describes her as very can-do. She is a very good example of a strong woman who is also kind and compassionate, actually. And she is a large lady with body confidence, and she helps Theodore to come out of his shell, and they have a very sweet relationship. She is sort of nurturing and kind and uh, I almost said maternal perhaps not that's not quite the right word Theodore thing is they're going to be married but she has that very sort of nurturing gentle relationship with him but if she needs to stand up for herself or for somebody else and assert herself she's not afraid to do so the thing that Theodore and Eleanor do have in common of course is their love of cookery and eating what they cook and enjoying different foods and this is reflected physically, as it often is in cartoons. But Simon and Jeanette's differences don't seem to gel. But I always think Eleanor and Theodore's character differences do gel. Which just goes to show Simon and Jeanette could have been carried off more effectively with a bit more effort. Perhaps because Jeanette's rather a weak character, I suppose. I think she's definitely the least defined. Well, do you remember the episode where they're trying to work out who broke the statue of Thomas Jefferson from the school? Mm, I've always remembered that one. It's a very memorable one. But what we didn't spot for a long time or remember... Was that Alvin, Simon, Theodore, Eleanor and Brittany all had a story to account for their whereabouts and Jeanette didn't. And what actually happened was that things that they were doing that they didn't realise, like a basketball going, bouncing off, and Eleanor and Brittany practising for the small play and firing an arrow at the gong and making a sound. You know the sort of thing. It all culminates in this trolley running out and knocking down the statue. And they go to the principal and say, oh, well, we all did it. And Jeanette's with them. She didn't do anything. She didn't have a story to say what she was doing. Nobody notices. The first five or six times they watch the episode, Jeanette has no flashbacks. Absolutely extraordinary. So I think Jeanette is rather poorly treated as a character. I think so. Actually, this reminds me of something else that Janice Carmen was talking about on my DVD. She was saying that when Alvin and the Chipmunks started, they were getting a lot of fan mail for Alvin and a lot of fan mail for Theodore and not a lot for Simon because even though he is a strong character, a heavily featured character, he's not very interesting. He's not cute like Theodore and he's not wacky and out there and bringing out the demon in you like Alvin. So she was saying that they decided to make an episode about Simon feeling jealous or uh, neglected. I'm not sure what the right word is because Dave was worrying a lot about Theodore, the baby, and Alvin, the troublemaker, as Janice herself put it. And I think the episode I'm talking about ended up with Simon running away because he felt that he wasn't needed or he wasn't appreciated. And then they all went to find him and said, don't be silly, Simon, of course, we love you. And then Dave explained, I don't worry about you, Simon, because you're all right and I'm so sorry if you feel neglected and you mustn't feel like that anymore. And then Janice was telling me that they got loads and loads of letters from middle siblings who related to that. So I thought that was quite a nice story. There are a few things I like about Alvin and the Chipmunks now. I don't think I really noticed them or thought about them when I was young and thought of the car the Chipmunks aside or something I didn't really like. But I do like the relationship between Alvin and Brittany. As Rosie was saying, it really is a true love-hate relationship. They have a lot of banter and arguing and things, but whenever it becomes obvious that one of them has had enough or isn't enjoying it or has something important, the other one stops enjoying it too, and they will help each other and be more open with each other and then revert back to their slightly sniping relationship afterwards. They have a very easy, comfortable, love-hate relationship. I also like, as we said earlier, the relationship between Alvin and Simon. Alvin, as the oldest brother and with the very domineering personality, often has the alpha male kind of status in the trio. But Simon is not afraid to stand up to Alvin emotionally and physically when he feels it's necessary. Simon judges himself, I think, to be in a position to know when it's right to stand up to Alvin because 
Simon and Alvin both know that Simon's a smart one and perhaps sometimes does know better than Alvin. So it's rather fun to see them butting heads in some ways, not really vying for the position of the male in the trio, but acknowledging that they are both in some ways the strongest of the three. If you want that kind of relationship in the Chipettes, then you sometimes kind of get it with Brittany and Eleanor, but uh, not so much. I think that while Jeanette will just sort of go with it and uh, fit in with whatever they decide. Theodore is a character who's very much admired and liked, I believe, for being cute and nice and caring and kind, which I think is very true. But I always wanted to see some sort of character development in him where he would stop being quite so babyish and stand up a bit to Alvin and Simon and assert his own personality. And as we will discuss later, my favourite ever Chipmunks story, which is kind of an extension of the Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon series, does start to touch on this. But because it's the last ever thing in that kind of continuity, it's not any sort of permanent character development you'll see carried on later in any other. By the way, how are the Chipmunks and the Chipettes looking at this point? Somewhat rodentine. They've got round cheeks, quite pointy noses, prominent front teeth. Then they were actually redesigned for the cinematic movie, The Chipmunk Adventure. Actually, this was in 1985, and I think some of the episodes where you see them with the newer designs predate the movie, but that kind of makes sense because they were redesigned and then it took time to make the movie, didn't it? So I think that's okay. Yes, it was made with a load of laid-off Disney animators, wasn't it? Which is quite interesting. You can read all about on this website with all the history how they felt that they didn't have enough money to make it look really spectacular and wonderful and fantastic. And they went and found some laid-off Disney animators who would do a really good job visually. Within with, the budget. Within the budget, yes. And by the way, you can also read that Janice was pregnant with their first child, Vanessa, while uh, she was running around trying to get this movie made. And actually, I sort of forgot I was trying to make a point about why the chip pets came into existence. I've heard it expressed in a couple of different ways. I read somewhere that they were thinking about providing role models for their daughter, but that's actually impossible as Vanessa wasn't born until 1986. But in this interview on the DVD, Janice says, we were doing loads of great covers of men's songs. I wanted to do some women's songs. And it all boils down to the same thing, doesn't it? They wanted some female representation, and I thought the Chipettes were great when I was a child. I thought, oh, good, Chipmunks are a girl, because it is good for girls to see girls on television. But I do remember the first time I saw the Chipettes, I was very, very young, but they were just having an episode, starting an episode, and I hadn't seen them before, and I thought, why are the Chipmunks girls in this episode? But then uh, over the uh, next perhaps 20 minutes or a few weeks, the situation became clear. But anyway, the Chipmunk Adventure, the character designs are much more, shall I say human or shall I say anthropomorphic? They're all, they're already quite anthropomorphic. I think it's fair to say they are much more human. That bit with Brittany in the <laughs> bikini, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it was a chipmunk at all. The chipettes in particular, because they have human hair, but they always have, look very like humans. They also have pink noses, whereas the chipmunks have black or brown noses, depending on which inc incarnation you watch. So you have to look at the nose quite closely and the teeth to realise that they are not quite human. Whereas the chipmunks don't have human hair, their faces aren't that human or aren't made to appear human because of the human hair, I suppose. The chipmunks always look furry all over their bodies. I mean, you can infer that the chipettes are covered in light brown hair, but, but their human hair on the top and the fact that they're not as furry looking as the chipmunks, they really do look very, very human, the chipettes. The colour of the chipettes is not the colour of fur, it's the colour of a white human being, really, isn't it? It. it is. Even in spite of that, I think they look nice in those incarnations. Perhaps because they were using them sort of late in the show's run and they'd really found their feet and those are 
the better episodes and the animation looks cleaner and nicer. So I always thought they they sort of look nice like that, but perhaps, in fact, they look a bit too human. I'll tell you what I think about the Chipmunk Adventure. It tries to be very epic, all this race around the world sort of thing, boys versus girls. But I think it falls rather short on characterization and good interplay and it has too much of uh, chipmunks need to be saved by the chipettes. I think they've spent a lot of time making the film look nice and trying to make it epic and in doing so they've lost quite a bit of characterization and humour. The one bit I think is laugh out loud and funny is where Alvin is attempting to splice together one end of a telephone conversation by ringing a very sleepy Dave. Yes, of course that's just something that could happen in any old Chipmunks episode, I suppose. But it's interesting that when you read about how they were trying to make it look nice with the budget that they didn't consider to be enough, perhaps in doing so... They neglected to make sure that the story was any good and the characterisation and the interplay was there. I'm thinking particularly of the Alvin and Brittany interplay at the very end, which I think falls very short. It's a bit too basic to really capture their relationship nicely, and I was kind of hoping it would after all that epic adventure. The premise is that they are racing each other around the world in hot air balloons, pink and blue respectively, of course. Ostensibly, because these eccentric millionaires have put a bet on them for the fun of it, but actually they're smuggling diamonds around. So what that means is that... The movie is very segmented. You've got the chipmunks doing one thing and the chipettes doing another thing. It's probably the best place to look if you want to see that Brittany and Eleanor slightly emulating the Alvin and Simon relationship because there's this bit where they find this baby penguin, actually. I think it's given to Brittany as a wedding present because she's supposed to marry this prince in another country. Brittany wants to go on with the race and Eleanor wants to take the baby penguin back to its family. And I quite like the line where Brittany goes, Jeanette, talk some sense into your sister! And Jeanette goes, she's right, Brittany. I thought that was quite clever of Jeanette, actually. She is talking some sense into her sister, but not the sister Brittany meant. It has its moments, the chipmunk adventure. I do think that bit, that whole sequence with the penguin is very good for Eleanor in particular. What I haven't mentioned, but everyone knows anyway, is that the chipmunks have never stopped singing. Their main thing is that they are a singing group, so it's always remembered its roots in that way. One of the best things that they did in the Alvin and the Chipmunks series, which after they got the new designs, they got a new opening sequence and they changed it to the chipmunks. One of the things that they always did very well was book and movie parodies. For instance, there's a Sherlock Holmes episode, there's that thing which had Sybil Shepherd and Bruce Willis in it, which was called Moonlighting, wasn't it? Alvy's Angels, of course, is a terrific episode. Brilliant episode. Ross Bagdasarian Jr. actually does a very good impression of John Forsyth as Charlie in his speeded up Alvin voice. We haven't mentioned, have we? Ross Bagdasarian Jr. is the voice of Dave, Alvin and Simon and Janice Carmen as Theodore and all the chipettes. Probably because someone realised this was what they did perhaps best or what they hadn't exhausted yet. The final season of The Chipmunks was Chipmunks Go to the Movies in which they would always do a movie parody. And I do remember particularly enjoying that when I was small. It was in 1990, that last series. So yes, I must have been quite small. That's the moment it was first on. And when we were a bit older, we must have been in our early to mid-teens, were we? It was being repeated on CBBC after quite a few years. And I was going, oh, chipmunks go to the movies. This is brilliant. Oh, we have to watch it. I have to watch this. And uh, Jake decided that he would watch it too. Yes, this This was actually during the latter stages of 1999, so it was quite an old show, and we were at quite a dark place in our lives. We were supposed to be moving house, and we couldn't, and we had to be somewhere we didn't want to be for five months. And Chipmunks Go to the Movies repeat, I found really surprisingly good, and it really cheered me up and restored my will to live in many ways. He did some very good movie parodies, some of them funny, all of them funny, some of them quite poignant and thought-provoking. I do like the Star Trek 
parody, which has a very important message about prejudice. I did like the Little Mermaid parody, which injects some interest into the Simon and Jeanette relationship. Of course, in it, Simon has to be playing the part of the scientist and Jeanette is a mermaid, but you can see there the potential for actually developing their relationship in an interesting way. People draw pictures of that who like Simon and Jeanette, because it's one of the few things they actually can draw pictures of from the show, isn't it? And the Star Trek one, again, Ross Bagdasarian does an excellent impression at half speed, doesn't he, of Captain Kirk? Absolutely brilliant, the impressions Alvin can do. But we enjoyed all of those, didn't we, Chip Tracy? Bat Monk was one. Oh yes, with Simon as the main character there, a moment yeah. in the spotlight for Simon. And Alvin is the Joker, but of course that's a nod to Jack Nicholson and being a diva, isn't it? Ah yes, of course. And the interesting thing about... An interesting thing, there are lots of interesting things, a quite interesting thing about Chip Mike's Goat in the movies is that the character that was right for the part would always get the part. So in Chip Tracy, Brittany was the Madonna character who Chip Tracy, Dick Tracy, kind of fancies, but then she turns out to be bad news. And the one who's right for him is this sort of glasses librarian woman. And that part went to Jeanette. So in that movie, Alvin's character ended up with Jeanette's character. Yes, you can see there the Chipmunks and the Chipettes displaying their in-universe acting skills by being with the wrong partner sometimes. Although it's annoying when people on DeviantArt and things ship the wrong ones for no reason. Mm, I don't see the point of that, but never mind. It doesn't directly affect our lives, does it? The movies would always be introduced by the three chipmunks saying, oh, look, let's watch the movie now. In slightly different kind of setting up to watch a movie situations, but I can't really remember any of them at the moment. Some of them were only so-so, I think, though, weren't they? For instance, Back to Our Future didn't at all have anything to do with Back to the Future. It was going back and finding them as they were in the Alvin show. Which is certainly interesting, but not really a movie parody. Mm, disappointing as an episode of Chipmunks Go to the Movies. As an episode of Alvin and the Chipmunks, it would have been good fun. And they sang the Alvin twist in that one, which I enjoyed. Then the Chipmunks are never really off the radar for very long, because in the 90s, I'm not sure exactly which years, but I think they were fairly evenly spaced throughout the 90s. They had these holiday specials, which I don't believe were ever shown on television here. If they were, I missed them, but I saw them on YouTube within living memory. The only one I really liked to any degree was the Halloween one, where Alvin's trying to get into this gang, and all he wants is the jackets, and they make quite some amusing situations, because what he's supposed to do to be initiated into the gang is play a really horrible practical joke on the character who has a deformity and Simon's saying well Alvin come on you can't do that and Alvin knows that really but he just keeps talking about this jacket which is quite funny and then Theodore befriends this person with the deformity and uses his compassion Alvin realises he mustn't play this practical joke and he ends up doing something to the leader of the gang and then Simon says I can't believe you did it that's awful I'm horrified I didn't think you had it in you Alvin because he thinks he's done it to the deformed person but then he hasn't and everything's fine. There was also an Easter one, which was nonsense. They were trying to prove that the, or Alvin was trying to prove that the Easter bunny was originally a chipmunk and he was taking somebody to court. There was this Thanksgiving one where they had to put on this pageant. That's all of them, actually. I think there was three. They don't feature the chipettes at all, and nor does the next thing. This is the next thing, isn't it? Alvin and the chipmunks meet Frankenstein, 1999. I mentioned earlier the last thing in the continuity of Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon, pretty much, and this is it. The two scary movies, which are from 1999 and 2000. The first one, Alvin and the Chipmunks meets Frankenstein, is very good and very funny and plays good homage to old horror movies up to a point, but it really tails off at the end, I think. After the lasagna goes out of the back door, it really goes to hell. <laughs> 
But the 2000 movie, Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet the Wolfman, is my very favourite Chipmunks incarnation thing anywhere at any time. It does have, as I mentioned, the potential character development for Theodore. The Chipettes return for the first time in ten years, and the relationship between Theodore and Eleanor is very prominent. The relationship between Alvin and Brittany is somewhat prominent at times, the relationship between Simon and Jeanette is non-existent. But we really get the sense in this movie, after Theodore's experiences with, spoiler, becoming a werewolf for a brief period, that he's starting to grow up, gain confidence in himself, in his relationships with Eleanor and his brothers, and it's a very nice thing to see. I also like the homage in there to old werewolf movies and so on, and the performance of Maurice LaMarche, Egon Spangler from Ghostbusters, as you may remember, as the wolf man is extremely pleasing and amusing and dark and chilling in all the right places. And just overall, I think this is the best, most well-rounded, most characterful, relationships got right version of the chipmunks I've ever seen. Alvin has a pleasing time in it as well, trying to go cold turkey from horror movies, and Simon and he have the relationship I like in it, where they're kind of vying for dominance of the scene, and of each other at times. There's a very nice scene early on, before Theodore's turning into a werewolf, where Alvin saves him from the bully. Oh yeah, so it even has Alvin as the protective oldest brother. It really does have everything. As I was talking about earlier, Alvin wants to do something wacky, and so I'm talking out of it. What he wants to do is go around proving that various people are werewolves, and Simon is saying, no, don't be ridiculous, of course they're not. Well, if I go along with it, will you leave me alone? So they do that for a bit. And then they find out that Theodore is a werewolf because he uh, becomes one in their very bedroom. And then they get together to try and help him and they're able to work together because they are protecting their brother, which is very nice. Sometimes a swan song of a continuity can be a bit lacklustre and have shades of what you used to enjoy about it, but it's not really there. But I think in the case of this incarnation of the chipmunks, it is a peak in getting everything right. The next thing... I don't know what year this was. It's 04, I think. 04. They did a thing called Little Alvin and the Mini Monks, which used live-action Ross Bugdasarian as Dave and Janice Carmen as this sort of daycare centre running woman. And the chipmunks were puppets. And I've seen bits of it on YouTube, but I couldn't watch it all the way through, because not only was it incredibly ugly, it wasn't very good either. It looks and sounds absolutely foul. Yes. <laughs> they all look like aborted fetuses. It's absolutely awful. I don't know what they were thinking. And they're at different stages of development, which doesn't make any sense, because they're supposed to be two litters of chipmunks. Theodore is the little brother, but he's only little by a matter of minutes. This goes to show how psychological that kind of thing is. There's an episode where Alvin has to stay at home on his own and he's freaking out and he says, I've never been on my own before, except for two minutes before Simon was born. If you want some trivia there, Alvin is two minutes older than Simon. And if you're one of these stupid people who go around saying that Simon's older, no he isn't. Simon's not older, he's just taller and more sensible. The one bit I do remember is Theodore as a sort of toddler dropping everything into the toilet, and Janice Carmen coming, and there's this sort of sequence of what her mind is doing with volcanoes and stuff, because she's really angry, and then she decides to treat the situation calmly and with respect to Theodore, and she says, Theodore, I see a lot of things that don't belong in the toilet, and I remembered that because I thought that was quite a good lesson to adults dealing with small children. Yeah, so perhaps it has its merits and places, even though it looks like something from hell. <laughs> but of course, three years later, the Chipmunks franchise came somewhat to its senses, and the Alvin and the Chipmunks CGI movie was released, following in the footsteps of things like Scooby-Doo. Garfield? 
And I think we were both pleasantly surprised by how well that film managed to achieve its chipmunk relaunching goals, weren't we? When we decided to watch that, I've been going, oh, no, 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 I don't know if I want to see that. Oh, it looks awful. Oh, it's going to be crab. Oh, I'm going to hate it so much. And then I said, oh, I better watch it and I see what it's like. And it opens with the three chipmunks in their tree collecting their nuts singing Bad Day, which I found hilarious because it was quite a big hit a couple of years before. So I found that an engaging beginning. The film went on and I just kept laughing, didn't I? And then we had to pause it because I needed to go to the loo. And Jake turned around and said, you're enjoying it. And I said, yes, I am. Assumptions and prejudices can be quite wrong. It's a very successful attempt to contemporise, or modernise if you like, an old show and keep the feeling, but set it in the modern world and have modern things like Bad Day all over it. And it's very easy to get that wrong, and films and shows that try to do it usually do get it wrong. But it was a very pleasant surprise that Albert and Chipmunks managed to get it right. In the trailer, there were certain bits that made us think the film wasn't going to be that funny, like the uh, toilet humour bits. But that was such a small aspect of the film, and generally it was impressive and a pleasant surprise. They sang their, um, and Dave wrote in the film, the Christmas song, which shows us that it very firmly remembers its roots, and of course it would do because Ross Bagdasarian's senior son and daughter-in-law were very much at the helm of the production. Jason Lee as Dave, I thought he was fine. Janice Carmen actually recorded the dialogue for Theodore, didn't she? But then they decided that it would be better to have a young actor play Theodore because young-ish... Actors were playing Alvin and Simon, Justin Long as Alvin, Matthew Gray Goobler as Simon, and Jesse Mc- McCartney. McCartney as Theodore. And I've seen the Jesse on one of the DVD special features talking about what kind of a character Theodore is. I think it was the squeakle again. And he was saying things like he loves his family and he wants them to be all together and things that I thought were quite obvious but uh, there you go he gets the idea and then of course you've got David Cross as Ian the record producer who adds some good humour to the film and his name's Ian Hawke which is very interesting because he's the villain and hawks are predators of chipmunks so there's a bit of symbolism it's been very carefully thought about this film, obviously. And once again, when the chipmunk is being relaunched, the chipettes are absent. But they do turn up in the sequel. I remember saying what they need to do now is they need to make a sequel where the chipettes come along and Ian, who has blown it with the chipmunks, tries to exploit them and make money off their singing. And as it turns out, that's exactly what they did. And they did it rather successfully, nicely integrated with the chipmunks and chipheads going to high school together. Yes, in the cartoon they went to elementary school, Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, but uh, for the films they wanted them to be slightly older kids. Very appropriate really, with the relationships that do develop between them, they should be high school. Christina Applegate as Brittany, Anna Farris as Jeanette, which came as no surprise because she plays parts such as Cindy in the scary movies and the pregnant girl Erica in Friends, who was completely dippy as well. So she plays characters who are kind of like Jeanette, so I could see the logic there. And Amy Perler, or Polar, as Eleanor. Some people feel that Brittany wasn't enough of a beat in that film. People who don't like it, that's one of the things that they say. Eleanor is very can-do, as Janice Carmen tells us, and Jeanette is quite dippy, but mostly what they're doing is just sort of going around doing their music for Ian, so there's not a lot of opportunity to get the characterisation in. Is that fair to say? Yes, I think so. I suppose they had their chance to really show up the Chipwrecks' different characters in the third film in the series, Chipwrecks, but they may have slightly misjudged it. I think they did. I think it does have its good points. What I do like about it is that it's the six of them hanging out. 
Britney is a bit more of a biatch in that one. Eleanor keeps cobbling together useful items out of what she finds lying around, which is not something she did in the cartoon, but it does show that she is very can-do. And when they're trying to find Jeanette, who's been kidnapped by the crazy woman, at the end, Eleanor knows the way to where she's taken them and is able to lead the way. Alvin and Brittany do have their love-hate. They certainly give it a go, but... uh, the scene that ought to be really good where they find the love where uh, Alvin's saying oh I'm terrible I've got everyone into such a bad mess and Dave's right about me and I'm irresponsible and blah 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 and Brittany's supposed to reassure him she doesn't do it very well so that was disappointing the Alvin and Brittany relationship isn't what it should be in that film but you can tell they know basically what it's meant to be another interesting thing about Chipwreck is that the Simon and Jeanette relationship is attempted to be that's why I didn't mention Jeanette, because it's the big thing now. But like the fact that's make it interesting in Chipmunk Go the movie is Jeanette had to be a mermaid at the time. In this version of making Simon and Jeanette interesting, Simon has to have been bitten, poisoned, and have developed an alternative personality to Simone. I mean, if you're going to develop Simon and Jeanette, I do it in the way that Rosie was describing earlier. It's much more interesting and engaging. Yes, I remember you summing up why Simon and Jeanette weren't really working on the screen, and you said something has to be different, like he has to be French or she has to be a mermaid, and uh, that just makes it all sound a bit crap, really, doesn't it? But you're right. Simon and Jeanette deserve more than they've received over. If they were going to do that, and they did do that, they should have done it better. For example, Simon gets bitten by the spider, and he says that the symptoms of, or the effects of the venom are personality changes and loss of inhibition. I mean, just loss of inhibition would have done, wouldn't it? Yes, they should have just said loss of inhibition, and then you could see that it was really Simon who wanted to be that way, rather than a change in his personality. And they're trying to do that at the end. Simon's saying, oh, I can't save everyone from falling off this log. I'm not French anymore. And they're all going, yes, you can, Simon. That was you. And we're like, was it? It's just not quite happening the way they wanted it to, Chipwreck. The other thing I wasn't that impressed with with Chipwreck was that they crowbarred in Ian and David Cross when really his story had come to an end when he failed miserably with both the chipmunks and the chipettes and they all hate him. Now, there's some sort of redemption for Ian and Chipwreck to show that, you know, he and Dave were once friends and there's still some goodness in him, but we could have done without that. Of course, it does give Dave someone to talk to while he's looking for them. It would have been better to concentrate on the relationship between the six chipmunks on the island. Yes, I agree. When he got thrown in the dumpster at the end of the squeak wall, that should have been the end of his story. Literally and figuratively thrown in the dumpster. I think in some ways... The squeak pull is my favourite, even though the first one is probably a better film. The second one's just got more chipmunks in it, and also they've established their relationships and their status quo, which is always good in a film where they're setting that sort of thing up, especially if it's got a precedent, it's based on a cartoon or something that you've enjoyed. You don't really want to see it getting set up again as much as you want to see it continue. Now, the relative success of these three movies led on to something that we also mentioned earlier, The new computer-generated Alvin and the Chipmunks TV show, which one can see on Nickelodeon. And I think it's a huge, huge misfire. As we touched on earlier, the fact that all the characters look horrendous in it. The only really rodentine thing about them is, well, they're small, like in the CG movies, and they have tails. But other than that, they just look like people. So they look like people with tails and slightly strange noses. It's really bizarre. But of course the important thing is that the show is rather bad. It fails to recapture the relationship between the characters properly. Alvin's just a jerk you know, it's he's not really a protective older brother with rough round the edges and arrogance. It's just horrible. In one of the first episodes I saw, therefore one of the first episodes on, because I went to watch it straight away, he's manipulating Theodore into doing something for him, and he takes it much too far and just becomes a bully. 
It's not right, is it? It's, it's like they've skimmed the surface of the proper chipmunk's relationship and made something that digs absolutely no deeper and therefore is not at all interesting. With the love-hate relationship between Al and Brittany, it's that old thing of where's the love? They just hate each other. So it's very disappointing that, but it must have had some moderate success, at least in the ratings, because there has been released very recently a four chipmunks movie in the franchise which we reckon is a kind of rehash of an old 80s episode and probably won't be nearly as good. The premise, certainly, that uh, the chipmunks think Dave is going to get married and he won't want them anymore. Although I think, actually, in the film, they're worried about getting a stepbrother, which is a bit different. But the premise that they think Dave's going to get married and things going to change is an 80s episode, yes. It's had some decent reviews from ordinary members of the public who say, I went to see this film with my daughter and she loved it and I thought it was all right. The second trailer, which I saw quite recently, had more bits that looked like they might be okay than the first trailer, so I'm holding out a certain amount of hope. I hope it has good chipmunks relationships. It appears from the trailers that the chipettes may have been rather sidelined. This trailer number two I mentioned, you see a lot more of the chipettes than in the first trailer, where you see them for about half a second. So all we can hope is that they've got the relationships right this time, and it will be a worthy addition to the series. Of course, there's another thing wrong with Alvin, isn't there? Alvin's voice is too close to Simon's. Oh, that's right. All you need to do is double the speed of any male voice and you get Alvin, as we know from uh, playing around with Jake's voice and our recording equipment. That's right. If you find a clip of Ross recording Alvin and Simon together, you'll find that he's actually saying things faster to be Simon, even though in the final edit, Simon is a lot slower. Because Alvin is just his normal voice double speeded, whereas Simon is sped up less and therefore starts at a higher pitch. That reminds me, of course, that Ross Vagzarian Sr., as I mentioned earlier, did all the voices of the Chipmunks in the Alvin show and the early releases, and that includes their singing, whereas if you watch Alvin and the Chipmunks, in the credits it'll say singers, this huge long list, and on one of my DVD special features you can see... Some random woman. I said woman in that voice because she's not recording for the chipette, she's recording for the chipmunks. But there is a precedent, I suppose, with Janice, Carmen, and Theodore. But anyway, you see someone who is not anyone who's ever voiced a chipmunk going and doing some singing at half speed to speed her voice up and later on all this different chipmunks' voices and instrumentals and all kinds of things for one of the songs. I find that quite interesting because Ross Bagdasarian Jr. isn't really a singer. Ross Bagdasarian Sr. in the Alvin show would do some singing as Dave. He sang Genie with the Light Brown Hair and he sang some of The Man on the Flying Trapeze, for example. I've only ever heard Ross Jr. sing On the Nth Day of Christmas My True Love Gave to Me not particularly well. He's not really singer and he's not a songwriter if there's a new song janice writes a new song and then some randoms come and record the voices whether it's for the movies or whether it's for the cartoon series i was talking earlier about how the element of sort of engaging children in music and getting them to join in has been kind of lost and so has the element of a musician bringing his music to the world via the chipmunks so some of the original intention, if you like, some of the soul, has gone out of it in that sense. But it's all being done in the spirit of the original, with the original premise very much in mind, and with great respect to Ross Senior, who created the whole franchise. So plenty of food for thought there, not only about the chipmunks, but about the changing face of the music industry over the past 50 years or so. And I think that will bring this podcast to an end, don't you? Yes, I think so. But do join us again next time for a podcast on the subject of the mysterious cities of gold. Something Jake has introduced me to in later life. But until then, good night out there. Whatever you are.